showing on Law Weekly another perspective on the recent wave of embarrassing and conflicting ex parte orders emanating from judges across the country. We speak to another former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Ulisa Agbakuba. We also have the latest update from the Lagos State Judicial Panel inquiring into the Lekki Tollgate shootings, plus a recap of some of the top trending legal stories. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shieli. The week began with the CJN demanding for the records of proceedings in all of the suits on which conflicting ex parte orders were given, after which the CJN met with the chief judge of the FCT and the chief judges of six states whom he had summoned last week. The CJN, who was said to be visibly angry, told the judges that they must put an end to indiscriminate granting of ex parte orders, conflicting judgments on rulings occasioned by forum shopping. Three of the judges who granted the conflicting ex parte orders have also been summoned to appear before the National Judicial Council to show cause why disciplinary action should not be taken against them for granting the ex parte orders. On the show today, we bring you the perspective of a former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Ulisa Agbakoba, to all of these issues. The NGC is not rising up to the challenge. When the late Justice Dahiru Mustafa was CJ and he resolved all this, he set up a panel, we came up with a blueprint to, re to remove all these, you know, challenges. But unfortunately, the, the, the late CJN had only three months, six months. When he retired, the incoming CJN, Aluma Mokhtar, didn't do anything about it. So the judiciary is still challenged with the same problems. Politicians are very desperate, as you know, and they are desperate people to look for desperate lawyers who will find desperate judges. So I would ask a question. I'm Mr. Justice Ulisa Bakaba, sitting at the Oka High Court, and I see an application expected before me in respect of election matters in Kogi State. Won't I ask the council, why are you here? That answers it. So the judge in Jigawa or wherever else, wouldn't they ask the question, why are you before me? The territorial jurisdiction of the court doesn't extend to you coming from Oka to Jigawa. So they should strike it out. If they don't do so, I, I will not prejudge since the CJN and the NJC are now, you know, engaging with the matter. I think they're going to set up relevant investigative panels. So I do not want to prejudge. But all I'll say is that it disgraces the judiciary with all the conflicts we've seen. And I think the CJN took the right step to summon the relevant CJs for the explanation that is now on course. But it doesn't make us lawyers and the judges look good in the eyes of the public. So I, I look forward to the sternest possible punishment for all those involved, including dismissal from office, so that we can, we can send a strong message. Otherwise, it's going to continue. Does that mean that there are no instances in which lawyers can forum shop? Because I've heard some senior lawyers say that technically there might not be anything wrong with it. No, there's something wrong. There's some, what do you mean? There's something wrong. There's something wrong. How can you go? I mean, does it make sense that a land case, say, in my home on nature, I take it to, to, to Casina? Does it make sense? I mean, conceptually, the argument might be that there are some instances that you can forum shop. But the Supreme Court has made clear, I don't recall the case now, that cases must be assigned to their home jurisdiction. I think this case came before, was filed in Kaduna. I don't quite remember the facts, but it ought to have been filed in Asaba. And the Supreme Court made the pronouncement on this. And I think that case should guide everybody. So if lawyers argue that it, it's, there's nothing really wrong, then my point would be that there is something wrong if a case is not in its home jurisdiction. I remember Justice Archibong, you know, my classmate, he was very strong on this. If you brought a case to him when he was sitting in Jost as a federal high court judge, he would say, no, why are you here? Lagos. And he would make the relevant transfer orders. So I think on the whole, whether or not you know, 
there is jurisdiction to do this forum shopping, it just doesn't make sense for a judge sitting outside of the jurisdic home jurisdiction to consider the case and not only consider it, grant ex parte orders. If a judge, if, a, if, if I have a case outside of my jurisdiction and I'm being asked to grant an ex parte order, it's a warning, I know something is wrong. So I hope these judges will be severely punished. So how do you react to the action taken by the CJN summoning the heads of courts? Because some people are saying that it really doesn't have such powers, that it should have left it for the NJC to handle. I disagree. The CJN is, the head, is seen as the head of the Nigerian judiciary. Structurally, the CJN has no control over any judge, actually. You can't summon a judge. But we all know that CJN is the head of the judiciary. And if we request a judge to come see him, or the CJ of a state to come see him, I don't think there's anything wrong. And don't forget that when he chatted with them, he referred it to the NJC. So I don't know what's wrong with that. Same thing for the NBA. They say that they're going to collaborate with the NJC. And people are saying, I mean, you know the lawyers involved. Why not hold them before the LPDC for discipline instead of saying that you're going to collaborate? It looks like we're shying away from the issues. You know, but working together is also good. They two, they are two, no, no, but there are two arms of a problem, the lawyers and the judges. So if the NGC and the NBA have a common position to, to get rid of a, common, of, of a problem affecting the image of the legal and judicial systems, well, I don't see what's wrong with it. So I, I would imagine that the president of Nigerian Bar meeting with the CJN to have a collaboration. Don't forget that we need to ask what do we do about these lawyers who deliberately take these cases and go forum shopping. So there is a twin headed problem here. So I don't think there's anything wrong in the CJN and the MB collaborating. But the MB has its own track of discipline. Yeah, so I would expect the MB to unleash its own you know, track of discipline against those lawyers involved. As a former president of the bar, can you tell us why does it appear like the bar is especially reluctant to punish senior lawyers? Because we've been down this road before where we've seen this kind of judgments over conflicting others. But why does it appear like the bar is always seemingly reluctant to punish its members? That, que that question you should put to the NBA president. Well, I'm, not long, I'm no longer the NBA When I was there, I did my own part. But well, right now, you ask the question to Mr. Olu Akbata. But I agree with the implication in your question. Why does this keep recurring? So we need to make examples of lawyers who abuse the process. We need to make examples of judges who abuse the process, which is why I endorse the CJN MBA collaboration. So let's say once and for all, let's nip this cancer in the board. It's far too long now. It occurs all the time. Whenever the political cycle comes, every four years, there is election, everyone goes berserk. The judges go berserk, the lawyers go berserk. So they have to be punished. I agree entirely. For the politicians who, who start us off on this route, mm -hmm. is there anything that they can do? Uh, the politicians can face the relevant law enforcement agencies because they are corrupting judges. They are corrupting judges. So if it is obvious that a particular politician has done something wrong that breaks the law, then who would expect the criminal enforcement process to kick in? But the problem is that the corrupt electoral system is overwhelming institutions. The legal profession, the judicial profession, the criminal justice profession. So we need to really say to ourselves, we need to take strong measures to check this rubbish so that 2023 will be free and devoid of corrupt practices. Easier said than done, but we need people who can do it. And I hope that Ulu Akbata for the bar and the CGN for the judiciary can rise to the occasion. This practice of the conflicting decisions of the various courts has enough sanctions within the system to deal with it. So what we, the only thing we are, that is missing is we're not seeing heads on the block. We need to have blood drawn, put the head on the block and chop it. 
So the next person will say, ah, this is getting serious. But if it's just to sanction the person, retire him, he goes home. But if, suppose a judge is found liable, is dismissed, and is prosecuted, and jailed, that sends a strong signal. Away from issues of conflicting court orders, let's talk about the judgment on VACT and the implications and the calls for restructuring that it has even triggered. How are you reading that one? It's good now. Absolutely. You know, I've always said it is not a press conference event. It is something that is doable. Fabian Falana produced a brilliant paper where he showed that restructuring is possible within the parameters of the present constitution. So this is an example. You don't have to wait for a conference for you, the governor, to exercise powers vested in you in the constitution to create electrical power in your state. I hope you know it's in the constitution that governors can create electricity in their state. So why all this noise? It's on, it's on the concurrent list. So why, why, why are you waiting? Why are you waiting for? You can do practically a lot of things. So, when some of the lawyers looked at it, so by the way, it started with lawyers, with FIRS sending us all kinds of notices. Pay this tax, pay this tax. So a particular lawyer in Port Harcourt said, no, I'm going to court. And he went to court, and the court said, you are right, that there are all kinds of taxes, but who collects depends on where it falls in the Constitution. And that, being a consumption task, tax, is not in the exclusive list. So FIRS that has been collecting all this tax is unconstitutional. So it's a simple argument. So um, Ukala, SAN, who took the matter first to court, won. And of course, that energized Wiki. And Wiki said, ah, this is a good point to take to court. So Wiki was simply exercising the powers vested in him by the Constitution by asking the judge, am I authorized to collect that or is it the federal government? And the court said, it's you. So it's a no-brainer. I don't see why it's an issue, actually. Because it's in the law. But the, the, the governors have not had. You see, the governors have become very timid. Any time they have a problem, you see them climbing the staircase in Nassau Rock. Rather than doing the thing in their state, walking, looking at the Constitution to see what kind of powers that has been bestowed on them, including the one I talked about, electricity, that they can do a lot more than they are doing. So all that has happened is an exercise of constitutional power by a river state, now Adama, now Lagos, and I'm sure it's going to go to the Supreme Court, which is why FIRS, realizing the strength of the case, has run to the National Assembly. Oh, so, oh, so they know. So they know. So it, it's all good to strengthen our democracy because we have a centrifugal federal process where it's a pyramid. All the, everything is here. There's nothing here. So if Wiki says that he pays $15 billion to FIRS, no, not to, yes, to FRS. But if, it's, if you change it around, he gets it for his state. Why should he pay tax to Abuja when he needs it for his state? So it makes sense. This, the first thing is to say, was the judge right? I think he was right. But it's going to go through the, the process of appeal. So it's going to go to the Supreme Court, and then there will be clarity. clarity. The political issue presented by FIRS to the National Assembly will be debated. And remember that it will require the concurrence of two-thirds of the states. So that will be where the argument will be interesting, to see what states will concur and what, which ones will not. So like Wiki rightly pointed out, if you really create a mechanism for internally generated revenue, you will find that it's in your interest to collect your own revenue yourself. Why should the federal government collect and give it to you? So I hope that the attempt to amend the Constitution fails so that the states are the ones responsible for that. Because the states have no money. It's obvious. The states are actually technically insolvent, most of them. So why shouldn't they want to have the opportunity to collect tax?
Welcome back. The much-awaited forensic report from the Lekki toll gate as to the events of October 20, 2020 has finally been submitted to the Lagos Judicial Panel on restitution for victims of SARS and other related matters. We have some of the key highlights from that report up next. Uses is admitted and marked going to be big. It's the 122nd sitting of the Lagos Judicial Panel on restitution for victims of SARS-related abuses and other matters. And the focus at these proceedings is the long-awaited forensic report from the Lekki Gate shooting of October 20, 2020. On the 29th of December 2020, the Lagos State Government had engaged Sentinel Forensic Limited, a private company, to conduct a crime scene investigation, examine the Lekki Concession Company's CCTV footage, and give digital expert opinion on the recording of the incidents, as well as any evidence recovered during the visit of the panel to the scene. A director of the forensic company, Joseph Funshuako, compared the evidence submitted and this is the findings as to the ballistics. The Nigerian Army submitted four ammunition. Two of them were 7.62 by 39 millimeter caliber. And that was the, the live one and the live that hadn't been fired. And two of them were 7.62 by 51 millimeter caliber. They are, they are both different. You have 7.62 by 39 millimeter ammunition. One fired, and this was of the live kind of ammunition. And one was a live ammunition that was not fired. Then you have blank rounds that were tendered. One of those blanks was fired, and one of those blanks was not fired. And the blanks that were tendered were 7.62 by 51 millimeter, which is quite different from 7.62 by. Now, it is possible to determine, you know, what firearm fired what. Um, this is possible. Uh, uh, once you have the cartridge casings after the bullet has been fired, and you have the firearms in question, your suspected firearms. If you take a test fire from your suspected firearms and with the, you know, the cartridge case in question, you can determine with a high degree of certainty which of those firearms you know, discharged that cartridge case. We can't say what time it took place, but we can tell you if that firearm fired this ammunition. I mean, to determine the time, you may have to rely on other things, but what we'll simply do is a ballistics matching to see if this casing fits this firearm. On the video evidence submitted by the Lekki Concession Company and the investigation of the crime scene, the forensic expert gave this analysis. For the digital uh, evidence, um, the authenticity of the video evidence standard by LCC could not be determined as we have no access to the servers from which the source recording was made. Uh, however, during extensive visual examination of the captured footage, because uh, we reviewed the footage frame by frame, um, the evidence that the footage given to us did not show any signs of being doctored. So the time frame and the pixel were consistent, suggesting that the integrity of so the integrity. The panel has adjourned till Saturday, September 11, to give lawyers in the matter an opportunity to study the forensic report so that they can cross-examine the expert witness on his findings. And just before we go, let's bring you a recap of some of the legal stories that made the headlines. We begin with the reports that the Chief Justice of Nigeria and Chairman of the National Judicial Council, Justice Tanko Mohammed, has held a marathon meeting with the six chief judges invited over the conflicting ex parte orders emanating from different parts of the country. A statement from the spokesperson of the NJC, Sojuyi, says that the CJN first had a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the chief judges as well as the chief judge of the FCT, Abuja. The CJN, who was said to be visibly angry, told the judges that they must put an end to the indiscriminate granting of ex parte orders 
conflicting judgments or rulings occasioned by forum shopping. Three of the judges who granted conflicting ex parte orders have been invited to appear before the National Judicial Council to show cause why disciplinary action should not be taken against them for granting the conflicting ex parte orders. The statement was, however, silent on the identity of the three judges. At the Supreme Court, the Attorneys General of the 36 states have sued Abubakar Malami, Attorney General of the Federation, over the alleged failure of the government to remit funds generated from stamp duties into state accounts. The states are arguing that they are the sole authorities to collect stamp duties and not the federal government. The Supreme Court is yet to fix a date for the hearing of the suit, which is coming at a time where there is conflict between some states and the Federal Inland Revenue Service over the collection of value-added tax, VAT. Meanwhile, the appeal court sitting in Abuja has ordered all parties to maintain status quo and refrain from taking action that would give effect to the judgment of a federal high court in Port Harcourt that allowed the River State government to collect value-added tax pending the hearing and determination of the instant suit. A three-man panel of the appellate court led by Justice Harunat Samani gave the order on Friday while ruling on an appeal filed by the Federal Inland Revenue Service. And away from issues of revenue, the 12 associates of Yoruba Nation agitator Sunday Adeyama, also known as Sunday Buhu, have instituted a rights enforcement suit against the Department of State Service for being paraded in the media as criminals. They filed the suit before Justice Obiara Iguatu of the Federal High Court, Abuja. In the suit, Igboho's associates sought a declaration of the court that their detention beyond 48 hours and their media parade without a court conviction constituted a breach of their fundamental rights. They also sought an order of perpetual injunction restraining the DSS from interfering with their personal liberty and freedom of expression. Similarly, the applicants asked for an order granting the sum of 100 million naira for aggravated and exemplary damages against the security outfit for what they termed a serial breach of the constitutional rights. During the proceedings, counsel to the DSS, Idowu Awul, told Justice Eguatu that his case file was stolen from a member of the legal team who was meant to bring it to the court. Justice Eguatu has, however, ruled that the file of the fundamental rights suit would be returned to the registry for reassignment since the court's vacation is ending soon. In another rights-related suit, the detained leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, IPUB, Namdi Kanu has dragged the federal government of Nigeria to an Abia State High Court. The federal government, the Nigerian Army, the Department of State Service and the Nigeria Police are respondents in the suit. He also asked the courts to mandate the respondents to pay the sum of 5 billion naira for the physical, mental, emotional, psychological and other damages he claims to have suffered. The next hearing date is set for September the 21st in here. And we round off with the reports that Chidin Maojuku, the suspected killer of the chief executive officer of Super TV, Usifu Ataga, is to face prosecution for murder. Counsel to the police, Cyril Ajiofo, told Magistrate Adeola Adedayo that the police had received the legal advice from the Office of the Directorate of Public Prosecution, DPP, on the case. The DPP's advice shows that after careful consideration of facts available in the case file, a prima facie case of conspiracy, forgery and murder exists against a 300-level mass communication student of the University of Lagos, Chirima, and another person, Adidakwa Quadri. Through the DPP, the Lagos state government has filed an eight-count charge at the Lagos High Court against the duel. The government has also filed a counter of possession of stolen property against Chidima's sister, Choma Eguchu. The case is, however, yet to be assigned to a judge for hearing.
And that's our program this week. Don't forget that you can find these and past episodes of the program on our YouTube page. I'm Shalashi Ele. Thank you for watching and see you next week.